Washington, Brussels, Paris, and London, there were two ambassadors. And the ambassador that was chairing the negotiations for the group of 77 was from the South, from the Christian South, ex McKinsey, ex World Bank person. But the negotiating team from the US attacked him, assuming he was from the North. And of course, created an additional <coughs> mistrust among negotiators that made it impossible to agree. Uh, the EU politics. Um, I mean, sometimes the EU can be really good and very forward in particular like climate change. It had just absorbed large, large parts of Eastern Europe, many of which were not committed like Poland to uh, addressing climate change. We're having its, mo its own problems. Definitely when the United States came up with an agreement, which was known as the Copenhagen Accord, which I'll come to in a second, um, the, U the Europeans didn't challenge the United States. They went along with it. And finally, the campaigners, the NGOs, the groups that I was associated with, also got an end wrong. We were not universal in our criticism. Uh, we criticized the United States and Europe, but we didn't criticize Brazil or China or India. So by not doing that, there was no pressure. And in certain countries like China, it's very difficult to have uh, pressure on the government. So the Copenhagen Accord was, in retrospect, a really important achievement by President Obama and by Hillary Clinton. Um, it, Basically, in that last few days, the American government took over the negotiations and brought together a, a document that was not a uh, legally binding agreement, was just an accord. If they had run the meeting differently, if they'd been nice to Sudan and actually invited them to their key meetings, then they might have got this as an agreement. But the important aspects of this were really good. One was that they were going to try and uh, keep the, um, the temperature down uh, uh, and move towards a two degree uh, scenario. Um, that countries would commit to giving targets, and that would include developing countries. And that there would be $100 billion by 2020 to be able to be given to developing countries to help with their uh, impacts of climate change. So, in retrospect, uh, through the mess, uh, President Obama and Hillary Clinton did actually save the agreement. Um, and, and that's a comic I'm hoping to produce on the right hand side. And you can uh, you give money through uh, one of the platforms uh, for it. Um, in 2010, uh, Jochen Rockström, 23 uh, of the world's best scientists, came up with some data to suggest that there are nine planetary boundaries, one of which is climate change, others which are acidifi uh, ocean acidification, which is impacted by climate change, uh, others are water or land use, some of which the data is hazy about, but that these are the critical ones for us to live sustainably on this planet. We have to keep within those boundaries. Clearly, we're not in certain cases. And that they interlink with which was the first real attempt at addressing an interlinked agenda. Oxfam came out the next year with what's known as the Oxfam Donut. And what they did in the run-up to um, the Rio Earth Summit in 2012 is they looked at what governments had submitted as what should be the critical issues for that summit. And they crowdsourced what governments were saying and they came out with water, food, health. But these were the critical issues for the social foundation that each country, each community needs to have if they're going to have a good quality of life. And that the difference between that social foundation that we all want to have and the planetary boundaries is the safe and just space for us to live in. And that this played a critical role in helping the conversation around the sustainable development goals, particularly the interlinkage conversation. 2012, five years from the um, announcement by President Lula that there would be a summit, there was a summit. Um, and that summit uh, came out with a number of things. 
they did two organizational things, not very sexy, but really important. It said every year there will be a new high-level political forum. And every four years, which is in the time of the office of most presidents and prime ministers, that they would come together at heads of state to see if they're working, if they're moving on the right direction. And that the UN Environment Program, this thing that we talked about, that, uh, had a role as the custodian of the environment, had a role as the science base, actually only had 66 countries that were elected onto it. So they made it universal, so that therefore all countries were going to be engaging in the conversation on the environment as we move forward. There was a hope to get some of the sustainable development goals agreed at Rio. And the European Union put forward a paper with a number of suggestions on what they should be. Um, that wasn't possible. So they set up a process where member states would um, try and develop before 2015 a set of new goals that would replace the Millennium Development Goals. But then these goals then had to have a finance mechanism to fund them. So a finance conference was called for in 2015 to address that and the committee will be set up to import some new ideas on how um, the money for delivering such an agenda would come from. And then finally, the issue of technology transfer. That if you want developing countries to develop more sustainably, they have to have access to the new technologies. But there had been no real attempt, except in a few isolated areas, for the transfer of technology from developed to developing countries. And so a new technology facilitation mechanism was going to be set up. So not <coughs> huge uh, in the, the kind of impact in 2012, but huge in setting the firm foundations for the future. The International uh, Energy Agency in 2000 12 said we need to aim uh, to keep under a two degree uh, centigrade rise. I put the Fahrenheit there because I realize, unlike the rest of the world, America uses Fahrenheit. I'm still not sure why. Um, uh, at four degrees, if we go up as far as four degrees, and so we're trying to keep it at two, at four degrees, it will be the hottest of 30 million years. And the consistent drought will cover 40% of the world's uh, arable land. Uh, and that um, we have a sea, line, sea rise of three to six uh, feet and half the species that we have at the moment. So if we get to four degrees, it's pretty dark. Present way of living, the way we are at the moment, and this was in 2012, um, we were on a six degree horizon. So certain countries like UAE, for example, will be unlivable. There wouldn't be able to be anyone living there. Um, what Paris did was to bring us back down to a 2.7 degree horizon. So we were on a, uh, a 6 degree horizon. We've now been called, pulled down to a 2.7. So one of the issues is, you know, does the science community uh, agree or don't? I, I love to watch John Oliver. Does anyone watch John Oliver here? So he's got a great um, thing on this. That 97% of climatologists, people who know something about climate, according to the World Bank, say this. And so, instead of dealing with this as someone says uh, this is a good idea or someone says this is a bad idea, that some people have uh, a, uh, on their show someone advocating that climate change isn't really happening and someone who's advocating that climate change is happening. And so John Oliver said, well, if it's going to be fair and balanced, I mean, using Fox, um, uh, as, uh, as an example, there should be 97 people sitting on the one seat and only three on the other. And that, that will be a fair representation. And I think uh, that he's right. So Bloomberg, um, <coughs> Bloomberg's uh, Business Week, it's global warming stupid. Now, for those of you who don't go far back as 1992 one, perhaps understand the significance of this. But uh, this is a takeoff of James Carvel, who was uh, President Clinton's um, aide and uh, basically advisor for the 1992 um, presidential election, where he said, it's the economy, stupid. 
and that that was the crucial issue that the 92 election would be fought on. And so Bloomberg <coughs> saying it's global warming issue. Well, clearly the impacts of Sandy uh, were felt, and in fact, if you look at the plan that New York is doing to address this, it's really impressive. Uh, they're assuming that these um, incidences are going to happen much more regularly, and therefore they have to set up a system to assume that, and so uh, they're planning for assuming these are happening within uh, every <coughs> 10 years. So I thought I'd put up uh, some quotes from some key Republicans. And the first uh, three are prior to the Tea Party's influence on the Republican Party. And if you read them, you can see that Mario Rubio, Newt Gingrich, President Bush, no question about it, they recognize the science. And the quote at the end is from President Reagan's uh, Secretary of State. And what he's saying there is he was persuaded by Mrs. Thatcher about the science. And he said, it's an insurance policy. If you're wrong, then you at least address some really important issues. And in the context of climate change, a move to clean energy isn't a bad idea in the first place. You know, it's less polluting, it's going to cause less deaths, uh, it uses less water. So it's not a bad idea to do it. But the Republican Party, at the beginning of the uh, 2000s, they accepted the science. So I'm not sure whether it's the GMO food they've been eating or whether it was the impact of someone else. So I can say that because I'm British. Um, and I have to say, you know, this experiment in democracy maybe hasn't worked. So if you want us to come back, you know, we're, we're quite happy to come back and kind of maybe, you know, look after you if, if, if it's not going to work. We'll have to see after the November election whether there's some takers for that. So in the preparation for the Sustainable Development Goals, there were 100 national consultations over the world. There were 11 thematic dealing with population, inequality, uh, energy, water. Uh, there were two Secretary General reports. The second one was chaired or co-chaired by my Prime Minister, by the Indonesian uh, President and by the Liberian President. And then there were 13 sessions of what was known as the Sustainable Development Goals Open Working Group. So it had been agreed there was only 30 seats. Okay, 30 seats. So how many people can sit in 30 seats? 30. 70. I didn't know that, but it seems that 70 can sit in 30 seats. The governments didn't want to not be part of it. So 70 countries had to sit in those seats. And so you only had 30 seats. So you had these buddy systems. So um, Israel, Canada, and the US were buddies. Um, Pakistan, India, and Sri Lanka. China, Cyprus, and Indonesia. It was a very strange thing. It was brilliant because it broke down the political groupings into a much more interesting process. And then there were eight negotiating sessions. So what is the difference between the MDGs and the SDGs? Well, the MDGs just apply to developing countries. The SDGs apply to every country. The MDGs address development. The SDGs address sustainable development. So you have goals on inequality. You have goals on climate change. You have goals on health and on jobs. The MDGs uh, address the problems, but the SDGs look to the symptoms, the causes, and the link to linkages between them. So, much more crucial. 17 goals, 169 targets, huge amount. But why are we in this position? Well, we're in this position because the previous 20 years, we spent most of our time partying and not doing what had been agreed in 1992. If what had been agreed in 1992 had been done, you wouldn't have 17 goals. But because it wasn't, because consecutive governments of whatever political persuasion focused on other things, then the world is in a much, much more difficult position. We are suffering from a situation where the prediction by 2030 is that we will need an extra 40% of food that we have now. So we're in that same situation as the end of the 60s, that we will need an extra 30 to 40% of energy. 
and that there will be a shortfall of water of 40 percent. So critical issue. Why? Because the population is going to go up by another billion. Because we've had massive urbanization. And because India and China did not choose a different path to development, but chose the path that we had done, then their impact has been enormous. And that's why we ended up with 17 goals. So the US will have to look and decide which of those goals and targets are most important. This is out of eight. So I tried to give an indication of what I thought were the most important goals and which were um, the less important for the United States. So clearly, climate change critical. Clearly, moving towards renewable energy, which will address water shortages as well. Clearly, addressing the oceans. We're at the sustainable limits on virtually all of the fisheries. I used to eat place when I was a child. Uh, you can't buy place now in the UK to have with your chips. Fish and chips being pretty much the only thing we've contributed to international food across the world. But you know, not a bad thing. To do. Uh, reducing inequality within countries. Who would have imagined that inequality would become an issue? Not uh, me in 10 years ago. But these are really important. So what should the US do? Well, I'm suggesting they need a strategy. President Clinton set up a National uh, Sustainable Development Council in 1996. The vice president chaired it for two or three years. You need another equivalent to that. Um, but local and regional governments should do the same. On the Paris Agreement, so fundamentally what came out of the Paris Agreement was that we would try and keep it to 1.5 to 2 degrees, 1.5 being better. Um, that would, the 100 billion that I talked about, that by 2025, that we would need to increase that. That all countries would have to submit their plans on climate change. And that there will be a stock taking in 2023. And what's been the impact? Well, the current climate agreement we have 188 countries. As I said before, a 2.7 degree uh, increase at the moment. So we've still got a long way to go to bring it down to uh, 1.5. I like the cartoon on the, uh, well, it depends which side you are, I guess, right or left. Um, yeah, what if it's a hoax and we create a better world for nothing? A better world's a good idea. The US will have to look at a cut of 80% in their CO2 emissions by 2030 if we're going to get a huge change by the next government. Um, that the suggestion that's been tried out in the UK is we need a new deal on energy so that more and more of the houses and the buildings have renewable energy associated with it. 70% of the uh, uh, emissions are from cities our urban areas. So that's where we need to focus with our local councils and our state, uh, uh, state officials. So I'm going to end with two points. The first one, both from Einstein, we can't solve problems by using the same thinking we used when we created them, but perhaps the more important one. Two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. Thank you very much. On here. So how, how should 
plays a critical role in, in, in all communities. Uh, and those can be ones which can support the um, addressing climate change. Um, all the religious leaders um, have committed to addressing climate change. It doesn't matter which religion you are. In fact, the Pope addressed the uh, meeting calling for uh, Catholics to address that, and in fact has written into the rules for all Catholic churches that uh, climate change has to be addressed. So that's going to be fascinating as that moves down uh, through some of the churches. Um, culture is a very important way of engaging people as well in the process. Um, and so I think it plays a positive uh, role. I think that there are problems with um, culture in other aspects, more in issues on women's rights and uh, inequality and things, but not so much, I think, in the climate change process. You know, the developing countries know that the impact of climate change is probably going to be greatest in their countries. And so they are very much um, wanting to address that issue. ways of addressing that. So, you know, you can do it uh, first and foremost, one of the ways of doing it is energy efficiency. That will be an easy start for low-hanging fruit. So, retrofitting um, houses and buildings with solar as a way of doing it. In the UK, we had this scheme which was a disaster, but um, was a good idea. And that was that they would come to your house and they'd look at your uh, energy bills for the last four or five years, they estimate what you will pay, we pay quarterly, not monthly like you do, um, what your bill would be. Um, they would then retrofit the house and then the energy cost would come down, you wouldn't pay anything and the cost of that uh, solar will be paid for by the differential, the amount you would have been paying, which you're continuing to pay, and now the new cost. So it was an interesting way of not having to put the funds up there. So that will be one way. Clearly, you know, uh, the move towards electric cars uh, needs to be accelerated. Uh, the move towards um, uh, not just solar but wind power and other ways will, uh, will be a way of addressing that. I mean, what I don't understand in the United States, which is a very libertarian country, unlike Europe, is why don't you want solar power? Because then you're no longer paying companies for it. That's always been a Thing that I've found very strange. Uh, but you know, you're, you're going to see a lot more growth in other things like rainwater harvesting, where uh, particularly in southern states, they're going to have to build houses as a requirement to have uh, water catchment uh, as well. Um, I think, you know, it's about all of the community and the business coming together and trying to address this uh, as a partnership. Uh, all right, great. Um, we are out of time now, but this is a reminder if you're in my recitation or in Christian's recitation to stay here.